and I share with a group of really smart people that I have a passion about and that we can all relate to. So I decided the topic I actually know a lot about is food. Um, I grew up in Kentucky in a uh, small rural area, so I have a really strong connection to food. Some of my best childhood memories are of going to a garden, picking that tomato straight from the vine and straight into your mouth. The taste of something straight from the vine, that cherry from the cherry tree, and here in, in, um, in Baku, my children, I'll come home from, from school or from my work day, and they'll be in the back garden, and they'll have a, they'll have a pomegranate in their hands, ripping it apart, and they're, they have pomegranate all over their face. So I have a passion for food. We all eat. Um, I'm not the only one who has a passion for food. As you can see, there's been a lot of, of talk lately about food in the future. Um, for most of history, we've pretty much eaten the same thing. It's pretty much come from the same place. Um, it's become more automated, um, but basically, it's the same. Where we are today is what we call industrial farming. Um, industrial farming is agriculture on a grand scale. Most of the food you eat comes from this. Uh, if not from the United States, which produces a lot of the world's food, from China, from your own backyard. But as we move into the future, something has to change. Um, the population of the, of the world is going to double, uh, will go up by 2.5 billion by the year 2050. 52% 52 of the world's population now live in cities. Most food is not grown in cities. It's grown far away from cities. A big problem for the world now is most of your food comes from really far away. Not just the farm next door or the farm 100 kilometers away, but it comes from Brazil if it's beef, or it comes from New Zealand if it's beef. So that burger has a lot of what we call food miles. What I'd like to present to you today is an idea about where our food may come from in the future. Because even if climate change doesn't happen, which I think it will, uh, the world is going to have a really difficult time having enough land, enough water, and enough people to produce enough food for everyone. It's an interesting, it's, it's an interesting quandary because one of the things I ran across as I prepared was that as of a few years ago, somewhere in the last few years, there are more obese people in the world, really unhealthy, fat people in the world, than there are people who don't have enough food. So there's about one billion obese people in the world and about 800 million or so people in the world who don't have enough to eat. So as I stand here today, the problem isn't that we don't have enough food, it's that we have too much. We have at least too many calories. I don't know if I would call a Pringles chip food, but it started as a potato. But, so we don't have a problem at the moment of feeding the world. The problem might be we have too much food or we have too much accessibility food. But as we look forward, and we look at increasing our food supply by some 60%, there just isn't enough land, enough water, to feed us all. This is an interesting um, photo from, uh, let me go back. If you can go back, please. Yeah, back. Um, this is actually um, a photo of something quite interesting. One of the things that got me stirred up about food was, as I said, I grew up on a farm and, and had a great connection to food. But as I got older, I kind of moved to the city, like most people do, as I just mentioned. And as you get to the city, you get a little further away. You start shopping in a grocery store. Uh, a farmer's market seems exotic. Um, and most of the things you get don't look like food anymore. They come in a package. They're covered with plastic. Um, but in the 1940s, something called hydroponics was developed. And hydroponics is basically growing food in a medium of water and some other things, some nutrients. Most plants nearly all plants don't need soil. Um, soil is a great way to grow plants, but plants will grow in water. Um, and interestingly, in hydroponics, you can add to the water or the medium exactly what the plant needs. So the plants grow faster, they need less space. So this is a rooftop garden, which is a great concept, but it's a rooftop garden which uses hydroponics. These small tanks have a medium of water and some nutrients in it where the plants grow, and this is in China. So part of our food 
our future food solution will, will harbor around hydroponics, this idea that you don't have to have heavy soil uh, to grow plants. Um, and the concept of LED lighting is also something that is going to change when we look at food. Uh, plants, most plants actually grow better under artificial light because, they're, again, artificial light can be uh, designed to make plants grow sometimes as much as three times faster than they would grow in sunlight. So the fundamental problem we have today with food is how to get this stuff to where people live. As I said, 52% of the world now lives in a city. By 2050, 80% of the world will live in a city. The food's here. Everyone lives here. As I mentioned, one of the concepts that has come along lately and I think is, is taking force in the United States and in urban areas is the idea of urban gardening. And some of you might know these two guys. This is an urban garden at the White House. Uh, when Obama took over, one of the first things he did, acknowledging one, obesity, but also the need for more sustainable food was they took a spot in the White House grounds and they put a garden, and it's, it's quite a nice garden. Unfortunately, rooftops, while they provide a wonderful medium for growing things, food, there aren't enough rooftops in the world to feed us. The great thing about rooftops is they're in cities where we all live. So your food is there. You walk to your roof, your grocery store has a, a, has a greenhouse on the top of it, your food's there. So it eliminates a lot of that carbon, the carbon miles, transporting food from around the world. The food is where we are. But as I said, unfortunately, urban gardens, rooftops, um, vacant space in cities just aren't enough. This is a concept I wanted to share with you today that I think is really an interesting idea. Um, this will actually be built in Newark, New Jersey. Um, Newark is an a particularly special place other than it has a great organization who's going to build this, and it's pretty close to New York. This may be what future food looks like, or at least part of it. Um, as you can see, it's gone vertical. As the world got more populated, we started going higher and higher in buildings because it's a cheap way to put more people into place. Um, here in Baku, buildings are going up to the sky, it seems like, because if you want to put a lot of people in one place, you can only go out so far. It's the same with food. Um, vertical gardens work in a lot of different concepts. First of all, they use hydroponics. As you can see, there's a large water tank. And they use uh, vertical, they go as high as you can imagine. Here are some other concepts. Um, Dubai has a concept in planning. Dubai, as it always does, is leading the world in building very large, tall buildings but they've looked at uh, the concept of vertical food as well. What vertical food requires is that you use some technology that exists. This isn't space age. All the things exist that we need. Um, and once one of these is built, you get four growing seasons in a year. You can grow almost anything you can imagine, and it's where you need it. It's in the center of a city. It doesn't have to be transported more than a few miles. Um, the energy would usually come from solar, um, but a lot of these things are just basic mechanics. Water is usually in the base of a building. It circulates throughout the building. Uh, nutrients are put into the water, and the plants grow in the building. A few more concepts. You can see here just how it works with the tanks in the bottom. And you get an idea of what the crops might actually look like inside the building. So I wanted to share that idea with you. But I know there are some of you are going, great, tomatoes, potatoes, I like meat. What about my beef? What about my chicken? Um, it's another TED Talk, or another TEDx, not today, but another concept that is catching on and may happen in our lifetime or quite soon is the idea of synthetic meat. Uh, in a laboratory now, we can grow meat. You take a, a stem cell from a cow, from a chicken, from a lamb, you put it in a culture, you do some stuff to it, and it starts to grow. No animal dies, you have meat. I don't want to ruin your lunch. We're not quite there yet. It doesn't taste so great yet. And they have to solve the problem of how you make the meat be muscle. Uh, at the moment, they shock it over and over and over. And the muscle contracts, and it expands, contracts, and expands. Um, about a year ago, the first taste of artificial meat happened. Uh, a reporter was in a laboratory. He saw this. and. Before they could stop him, he grabbed it, put it in his mouth, and ate it. 
He did live. He's fine. Um, but as we look to the future also, one of the things we'll have to look at is green plants are difficult. They come a long ways. But meat really creates a lot of, of, of issues for the planet. So vertical food might be the solution. I'll leave you with one last thought. Um, this is a printer, but it's a very unique printer. One of the technologies that seems almost disassociated with food is the idea of a color printer. Most of you have seen one. Those beautiful printers in your office that print out your color brochure, that print out your color thing. Well, they've come a long ways. The technology that allows you to print that piece of paper can be changed to print a perfect prototype of almost any item you can imagine. This little plane was printed on a printer. Layer by layer, over and over, it printed the little plane. Now, for industry, this is an amazing concept because you can sit at your computer in the United States and you can send a design to China or Taiwan or wherever, and they can have an exact, perfect replica of what you want. They print it. Maybe someday, and this is a viable concept, we could do the same thing with food. If you take a look at the uh, canister up in the top left corner, you have 20 canisters. One is dehydr dehydrated tomatoes, one is dehydrated lettuce, one is dehydrated um, croutons. The printer adds a little water, puts them all together, prints out your plate. Sounds a little bit weird, but it happens. The bottom left printer um, is chocolate. You've probably bought this and didn't realize it, but we use basically printers to make some really cool things with chocolate. Um, I remember going to a very nice restaurant in New York that I couldn't afford. Luckily, someone else paid for it. And they brought out the most amazing little dessert. It was just intricate, designed thing. I said, I said to the waiter, how did you do that? He said, we have a printer in the back. And I, I, just, I said, I have to see this. So he took me back, and it looked like a printer. And it was loaded with different kinds of chocolate. Boom, boom, boom. And there you go. It had a perfect little product. Um, this product here actually exists on the market. It's a product by Electrolux, and these little things in the corner are things that were printed by the food printer. So I hope you've got a few ideas. I hope your lunch still seems appetizing. I promise you it wasn't printed. It's not synthetic meat. Um, and the next time you pick up a plate, the next time you eat that burger or salad, just think about where does this come from today, and where is it going to come from next week? Thank you.